Hello and welcome to this talk on Houdini as a one-stop shop for the generalist. My name's Fraser Shires and I teach Houdini. I do that at Hipflask, which is an online platform for Houdini courses and tutorials, and I've also spent a couple of years teaching Houdini at the University of Newcastle in Australia. Before focusing on teaching though, I worked as a generalist for many years. I ran a small studio in Sydney called Forge and Morrow, and we focused on producing work primarily for the advertising and editorial industries. We produced a broad and varied range of work from photorealistic automotive and vehicle imagery to photorealistic environments, through to more stylized environments, and also quite playful environments. I've also done a lot of work with illustrated typography, which is always a lot of fun, and much of my work's produced as high-resolution still imagery for large outdoor format advertising, but a lot of it also gets output in motion. So why did I move to Houdini? Well, I could thank Autodesk for introducing me to Houdini. In 2015, they introduced the Max Creation Graph, which is a low-level node-based interface for creating your own tools, or what 3D Studio Max calls modifiers. With this being a new feature, there wasn't a lot of learning material available for it, and the Max community quickly started looking towards Houdini, and specifically VOPS as a way of learning how to work with this new node-based environment in Max. So after watching a few VOPS tutorials, I poked my head above VOPS, and I saw that the way Houdini worked in general was the way that I've been trying to work in Max for the last few years. Around that time, I'd just been completing a series of brand images for a pharmaceutical company who specialised in plant-based medicine. An agency in Sydney called Ward 6 had come up with this campaign titled Medicine Grown From Science, and we were briefed with illustrating each of the main plant ingredients behind their medicines as a series of still-life plant shots. But importantly, the plants were to be created from a series of scientific-looking components. The concept we settled on was referencing 70s style laboratory models, which had simple spherical shapes connected together with tubular structures to create physical molecular models. The way that we made these images was by leaning heavily on a couple of different plugins. We were using a hair and grooming plugin to generate and propagate hairs, or essentially copy curves along another curve which formed the stem of the plant. And then we were using another plugin to copy geometry to these curves. We were using a series of different rules and conditions to copy different types of geometry to different curves and to scale the geometry differently at different positions along the curves. So essentially, we were trying to work in a very Houdini-esque way, but by extending Max using a number of different plugins. And as you can see in these screenshots, some of the plugins use a node-based interface. I was already sold on the idea of proceduralism. Working procedurally provided creative flexibility. We could experiment with different distributions of different densities of the flowering area along the stems, and we could experiment with copying different types of geometry to the curves. If we wanted to try different compositions, then we could simply draw a series of different curves and use the systems to generate the plants along those curves. By working procedurally, we could turn around client feedback and changes quickly, and it was also far more efficient. Trying to make this same thing in the traditional way would mean positioning all these individual spheres in 3D space and then drawing curves to connect them all to the main plant stem, which would have been slow and tedious repetitive work. If we wanted to make a change, or just try something different, it would have meant a lot of repetitive rework. The thing is, to be able to work in Max in this procedural way meant that we were having to rely on a large number of different plugins. And not just when we were trying to work procedurally. To work on a wide and varied range of different projects, we needed a lot of different tools. And this is a problem which Houdini solves very well. Houdini already ships with a huge array of off-the-shelf tools, which you can start working with straight away, but fundamentally, it's a platform for creating your own custom tools. Now, you may have heard Houdini referred to as a framework for tool building, or maybe a development environment, or a 3D operating system. But what does this mean? Well, let's use a real-world analogy to compare Houdini with other 3D applications. If we were to think of a 3D application as a builder's toolbox, then a traditional application, such as Max or Maya, would be the toolbox on the left. It provides you with a series of off-the-shelf tools for performing specific tasks or specific functions. So that toolbox may include a circular saw for making straight cuts through materials. It might include a nail gun for fixing pieces of timber together. And it would probably also include a drill for making circular holes. In most cases, Houdini provides the same or an equivalent set of off-the-shelf tools, but it also provides us with all the components we need to make either an equivalent tool to the one which we're used to using in our previous application, or to make our own unique custom tools to achieve specific things. 
So if we wanted to build a drill that functions just like the one that we're used to using in a current application, then Houdini provides the gears, the motors, the switches, the battery packs, and the cables to be able to create a drill which works in just the same way. But let's say that the current task in hand means that we need to drill nine circular holes in a specific pattern. With the traditional 3D application, you would take the drill and manually drill nine individual holes one after another. But with Houdini, we can wire together the individual components to create our own special drill, which would drill those nine holes at the same time and in the specific pattern that we need. So let's dive into Houdini and see how it works as a tool building environment. I've created this network here to generate a stylized plant in the same style as the one which I'd made in Max. You can see as I pan through the network, it's composed of a whole series of small granular steps or individual processes wired together to achieve the overall result. I've colored the nodes which are providing the creative controls in pink. And if I select this first one, we can control how many segments of the stem we distribute the flowers along. In this next resample node, we can control the density of that distribution. So we can control whether we want to have a lot of shoots clustered within that area or only a few. And on this node, we can control the shape of the flowering area. So we can control the length of the shoots at the very base of the flowering pot. And we can control the length at the very tip of the plant. And with this ramp parameter, we have a very flexible control over the shape of that flowering area between the base and the tip. We can also see that there's a random generation of buds which have bloomed into full flowers. And there's also a whole number of other controls within this network to be able to dial in specific things. But we're just going to focus on these first three in this case. So we could consider this network the finished custom tool. We can wire in a different input curve and the system will generate a plant of this specific style along that curve. We can also manipulate and adjust the points on that curve and the plant will be automatically rebuilt to accommodate that new stem shape. Now, if we were just working on this project by ourselves and we've built this network so we understand what each node does and we've color coded it to make it relatively easy to navigate, then we could just work with this node network as it is. But it could be that we've got to this point and we're happy with this system and the look and feel of this plant. And maybe we've got client buy-in at this point and now we want to hand this over to a more junior artist to build out the rest of this composition. It could be that the artist we want to get to work on this project isn't a particularly experienced Houdini artist. And handing them a network of nodes like this might not make life all that easy for them. But Houdini makes it very easy for us to package up a network of nodes like this into a single node and with a simple and easy to use interface. To package this up into a single node, I can simply select all the nodes except the input curve and then click on this subnet button and that collapses the entire network within this single node. Now at this point, we still don't have the controls available on the parameter interface of this individual node but adding them is a simple drag and drop process. I can simply come up to this gear icon and select edit parameter interface and that opens this window. I'll just hide these input labels which we don't need and now I can dive inside this subnetwork to access my original network of nodes and now I can simply drag and drop the parameters which I want to make available on the parameter interface of the single node at the level above. So now I have all the parameters that I need. I'll just rename these to make it as clear as possible what each parameter does. And I can just apply and accept this. Now, if I step back up out of this subnetwork, we can see that on the parameter interface of this single higher level node, we have all those same parameter controls and they work in exactly the same way as they did before. So now we've collapsed this network into a single easy to use tool. How do we go about using this on other curves in the scene or sharing it with another artist to use in their scenes? We could just copy and paste this node around the scene and copy and paste it into another scene. But we can make it much easier to work with than that. Houdini makes it very easy to turn this into a tool which lives amongst the other tools within the Houdini ecosystem. And we do that by turning it into what's called a Houdini digital asset, or what's often referred to as an HDA. So to turn this into an HDA, I'll first rename this to something more specific. So I'll call it plant generator. And now I can right click on this and come down to digital asset and create new. And that opens this window where we can specify how and where we want to save this tool. By default, it's going to be saved to the main Houdini tool library. And if this was a general purpose tool, which we might use all over the place on lots of different projects, then this may be an appropriate place to save it. But in this case, this is a very specific tool to create a very specific style plant for this specific project. And so for this reason, I'm going to save it to my hit file directory. And this means that the tool will get saved along with all the other assets which are unique to this project. 
I'll hit create and that opens a second window. And in here, I'll just make sure that I have an input for my curve and I'll apply and accept this. And now if I bring up my tab menu and start typing plant generator, there's the tool. And I can drop this down and wire in a curve. And we see that it generates the same style plant along that curve. And all the controls on the node work in just the same way as before. Now I can very easily share this with another artist. They can install it in much the same way as they would load an external disk reference in an application like Max or Maya. But in this case, it's not just a static piece of geometry being referenced in from disk. It's a custom tool for procedurally generating this very specific style plant along any given input curve. So Houdini for me solved a frequent problem. I would often be working with remote freelancers and on a project like this, where in Max I was relying heavily on a series of different plugins to achieve a specific result, that freelancer might not have had those same plugins, which would mean buying a license for them, getting the plugins installed on the freelancer's machine, and then if they've never used those plugins before, they'd need to learn how to use them. And I'd need to spend some time explaining and demonstrating exactly how I'm working with them to achieve this specific result. With Houdini, I can create the system and process to do exactly what I want, and I can simplify that down into an easy to use tool, which I can easily share with another artist. They can quickly get up and running with that tool and be productive with it straight away. So we've seen how Houdini provides the components we need to build our own custom tools, but what about the off the shelf tools that we're used to using day in day out in a current application? Well, Houdini does provide a rich suite of off the shelf ready to use tools, which in many cases will perform in a similar way to the tools in the other applications that you're already used to. One example of this would be the path deform node. If we wanted to deform this piece of geometry along this curve, then I can just drop down a path deform node and wire in the geometry I want to deform and the curve I want to use to deform it with, and I'll just set the alignment that I want for the geometry. And now I can use these viewport handles to move the geometry along the curve. And this behaves just as we'd expect. The geometry gets deformed to the shape of the curve. And of course, we can come back to the curve and adjust the points on this to deform the geometry in that way. Now, what I want you to notice is that all three of these nodes have this little lock badge next to them. If I unlock the path deform node and dive inside, and I'll just maximize this pane, we can see that this path deform node's also made from a whole series of other standard Houdini geometry nodes. If I step back up out of this node, and we look inside the test geometry node, and the curve node, we can see that these are also Houdini digital assets composed of other Houdini geometry nodes. So when we create our own custom tools in Houdini, we're not working with some added special feature. This is the way that Houdini fundamentally works. Houdini is designed to be this open platform or development environment for creating 3D tools. The path to form and the curve node are nodes designed and built by side effects and they're shipped with Houdini, but they're made in just the same way as the custom plant generator tool that we looked at just a few moments ago. So for a generalist, someone who works with a wide range of different projects and across a broad range of different areas of the CG pipeline, Houdini can significantly reduce and simplify the number of different tools and apps you need to learn and use. Because for one, it already provides a vast array of off the shelf tools, but it's also fundamentally an environment where you can build custom and specific tools to suit whatever it is that you're currently working on. Now, I want to move on from geometry and look at how Houdini brings the same level of proceduralism to layout, look development, and lighting. This is an area of work which a generalist will often be working in, and Houdini can offer some real productivity gains here. In my work, I'd often need to produce a series or a suite of images rather than a single one-off image. With something like this, it would be typical that certain elements need to be shared and remain consistent across all of the shots in the series. So in this case, the background and the lighting needs to remain consistent, but the foreground objects change from one shot to the next. And this particular project was a series of consecutive covers for Fortune Magazine's annual 500 list edition. So let's jump into Houdini Solaris context to see how its procedural workflow can be helpful when working on these type of multi-shot projects. In this case, I've created a simple demo scene, which has three individual shots, and the lighting and background are shared between all of them. At the very beginning of this network, I've got my lights, and these are going to affect all three shots in the same way. It's going to be a consistent lighting scheme for the entire series of images. And then for each individual shot, I'm merging in three different sets of foreground objects, and these are just being merged straight in from the object context. I'm then setting the subdivision levels for each of these using a mesh edit node. And then I have these procedural transform nodes, which behave in exactly the same way as they do in the geometry context. 
we can turn on or off transforms, and we can keep adding additional transforms to move and transform things incrementally. I've then got an individual assigned material node to assign different materials to different components of the foreground objects, and this provides a nice visual indication within the network of which materials have been assigned to what. These three different sets of foreground objects are then being fed into this switch node, which I can easily use to switch between the three different compositions. After this, I'm merging in the background, which is shared between all three shots. I then have my render settings, which are being applied to all three images in the same way, which makes it easy to maintain consistency across the series. Then for each shot, I'm rendering the foreground and background objects separately. Having separate foreground and background renders just makes life easier in post, and it's a very typical thing to do for this kind of work. For each of these renders, I'm outputting a number of different AOVs, and I can easily see these directly in the viewport. And this is a really helpful thing about Solaris. We can easily see what's going to be output at any specific point in the network. Traditionally, working in my previous application, I would have been continually needing to do small test renders to check if my AOVs were being rendered correctly, or to test if I've set up my object visibility correctly. But in Solaris, we don't need to do this. We get this direct interactive feedback in the Hydra viewport of exactly what's going to be rendered at any specific point in the network. So having these three shots set up like this in this single procedural network is helpful because I can come over to this switch node and as I'm working on the three different compositions, I can quickly switch between each one to see how they're working as a series. For example, I can check to see if the volume of space that the foreground objects are taking up is consistent between the three different shots. If I need to make a change to the lighting, I can easily see how this change is going to be affecting each of the three individual shots. So let's just make a deliberate change to one of these lights. I'll enable this light mixer node. And for this main key light, I'll pump up the intensity. And I'll give this a purple color so that we can clearly see the edit that we're making. Now I can come back down to this switch node and I can quickly switch between the three different shots to see how this global lighting change affects each of the three compositions. I'll just disable this light mixer node again. And with the network branching off into these three individual streams like this, we can easily apply an edit to an individual shot in a way that won't affect the other two shots. For example, I have another light in this first shot here, which I'll just enable. And as we can see, I've given it the same purple color. But this time, when I come back to the switch node and switch between the three different shots, we see that this additional light's only affecting the first shot and not the other two. So we can see how Solaris makes it very easy to set up multi-shot projects like this. We can easily control which things affect all the shots on a global basis. And in this case, it's the lighting and materials. And then we can branch off into individual shots to be able to make edits which only affect a specific shot. And then we can merge everything back into a single stream again to apply things like render settings to all the shots in the same way. When it comes to rendering these shots out, we can automate the whole process using PDG, what's also known as the TOPS context. PDG is a powerful part of Houdini, which can be used to automate a whole range of different things. But one of the things that you'll be using it for most is for outputting your renders. So let's take a look at using it for that. If I come back over to my Solaris network, over here I have a top network manager. And if I dive inside, here we have another network of nodes that I've set up to automate the rendering of the foreground and background images for each of the three shots. In the tops context, we wire nodes together to define dependencies. We tell Houdini which jobs or tasks we need to be carried out in a specific order and which ones can happen in parallel at the same time. At the very beginning of this network, we have this wedge node. And this is generating an attribute called shot. It has a wedge count of three, and it's outputting values between zero and two. What this is doing is telling Houdini that we want it to create three separate tasks, or what PDG calls work items. If I right click on this output node at the end of the network and say generate node, we see that we get these three dots appear on each node. And these are the three separate work items, one for each shot. If I click on this first dot, then we see the dependency links drawn for this specific shot. So for shot number one, we're going to first render out the USD file to disk. And once that file has been written to disk, Houdini will render the foreground image from it. And at the same time, in parallel, Houdini will render out the background USD file to disk. And once that's complete, Houdini will render the background image from that file. And we see that the same will happen for each of the other two shots. So how do we get this top network to control what's happening in the Solaris context? Well, the answer is this attribute called shot, which is being generated by the wedge node. If I middle mouse on this first dot on the wedge node to bring up the info about this task, 
we see that it has a shot attribute value of zero. If I do the same on the second dot, we see it has a shot value of one. And if I do the same on the third dot, we see it has a shot value of two. These are the same three values which are used on the switch node in the Solaris context to switch between inputs numbers zero, one, and two. So we can use this attribute to control the input number on the switch node. So to do that, I'll step back up to the Solaris context and I'll navigate back to the switch node. And on this select input parameter, I'll enter capital P for PDG because that's where the attribute lives at shot, which is the name of the attribute. And now PDG is controlling this switch. If I navigate back over to the top network manager, we see that we now have three buttons on this node. If I click on the first dot, it switches to the first shot. When I click on the second dot, it switches to the second shot and clicking on the third dot switches to the third shot. With PDG now controlling the switch node, we also get this drop down appear at the top of the network editor. And we can also use this to switch between the three different shots. This is helpful because it means that we don't have to navigate back over to the top network each time we want to switch to a different shot. This drop down will be available wherever we are in the Solaris network. So now to render these shots to disk, I can simply right click on the top network manager and say cook output node. And I'll choose to save and continue. And now we get this nice visual indication showing us that we have three tasks being processed. If I dive inside the top network, we can see which jobs are currently being processed, which ones have been processed and which ones are still waiting to be processed. I've sped this up a fair bit and now we can see that all those jobs have been processed. Now, if I hop over to an image browser, we can see those six rendered images on disk. For each shot, we've got a foreground and a background render. So by combining Solaris with PDG, it becomes very easy to output the different renders that we need for each shot. The traditional way that I would have done this in my previous application would have been to turn on and off the specific object visibility that I needed for each shot, set the render settings for those objects, and then manually enter a file name and hit render. And I'd be doing this manually six times. This whole process would often be quite error prone and it would be typical that I'd make a mistake and leave one of the wrong objects turned on at some point and have to redo something. So setting this up as an automated process means that it's going to work reliably every time. And of course, it also saves a considerable amount of manual time and labor. Now, PDG is a very powerful automation engine within Houdini and it can be used to automate all kinds of different tasks, not just rendering. Something which I've spent way too many hours of my life doing before I used Houdini was adding damage and edgeware to assets in a sculpting application like Mudbox or ZBrush. Today, I don't have to do that kind of work manually. I just set up a procedural network in Houdini's geometry context to create that damage. And then I can use PDG to pull in the assets that I want to damage, run the process in the geometry network, and then save the new damaged assets back out to disk. So let's use PDG to automate a few more tasks in Houdini. And in this case, let's use it to automate some compositing work. Having a compositing and image editing environment within Houdini is something that I find helpful as a generalist because there's always times where you need to do quick bits of 2D work on a project. And that could be creating or editing a texture map, or it could be doing some compositing work to final renders, which is what we'll use it for here. Now, having the separate foreground and background renders is helpful for doing a final post work on these images. But when we're just viewing the rendered result in an image browser like this, then it will be helpful to be able to see the composited result to make it easier to check that everything's working as we'd expect. We could have set off a third render to render the complete image, but we don't really need to do that. We can just use Houdini's compositing context to composite the foreground over the background as part of the automated process. But let's also do a bit more compositing work than that. Let's suppose that these are the final high-res renders that have been rendering for some time, or they could be image sequences that have taken a while to render. And we're close to the deadline and there isn't time to re-render anything. Now, it could be that there are things I wanted to have done at render time but forgot, or that just weren't possible to do at render time. For example, maybe I'd want a shadow A of E, so I can dial in my shadow density in post. I've rendered these in Karma, and at this point in time, Karma doesn't output a specific shadow A of E. But we can easily generate one by compositing other A of E's which Karma does output. So let's set up a composite network to do that. Something else I like to do is create an additional beauty AOV and run my denoising on that. That way I have my original beauty pass and a separate denoised version. And this allows me to blend the two images in post. For example, I might want to mask the denoising to just a specific area of the image. Now I didn't generate this additional denoised beauty pass at render time, but in Houdini's compositing context, we have a denoise node which provides the same denoising options that Karma gives us. 
So let's also do some denoising within the compositing network and let's automate it all with PDG. So I'll step back over to my tops context. And in here, I've already created these three compositing networks. And for each of these, I have a composite output node to render the results of those comps out to disk. If I dive inside this compositing network, and I'll just enable my composite viewer, we can see the result of compositing the foreground over the background for the first shot. If I step back up to the tops context, we see that the composite output node for this has been positioned after this partition by index node. And this is important because for this compositing operation to be able to run successfully, we need to make sure that both the foreground and background renders for each shot are complete and have been saved to disk. And that's what this partition by index node does. It makes sure that the foreground and background renders have been completed before passing the job on as a single work item to the compositing operation. And it does the same for each of the three shots. You'll notice that as I click on the three different work items on this composite output node, in the composite view, we see the result of the composite for that specific shot. If I come over to this compositing network for the background and dive inside, at the beginning of this network, we've got this file node to read in the background render, which is being completed by the previous task in the top network. And in the composite view, we can see the different AOVs which have been generated at render time. I then have this AI denoise node where I'm using the Intel denoiser to denoise the beauty pass. And this does a pretty good job on smooth surfaces like this. And I find it can also be pretty effective for denoising shots with a heavy depth of field. I'm then generating my shadow pass by subtracting the unshadowed beauty from the beauty pass. And then I'm also making a denoised version of that. I'm then renaming each of these layers before merging them back with the original render. And now in the composite view, we can see those additional AOVs have been added to the original render. And these will all get output as a single EXR file when we render this composite network to disk. I'll step back up to the tops context. And as I click on these three separate work items on the composite output node for the background, we can see the composited result for each shot. And in the composite view, we can check the AOVs which will be output for each shot. Over here, I've set up exactly the same composite for the background render. Now, to render these composites to disk, I can just come back to the output node and right click and say cook node. And we see that PDG is clever enough to know that the foreground and background rendered images have already been processed. And so it doesn't need to rerun the Karma renders. It just runs the compositing tasks using the images which are already saved to disk. Now we can see these jobs are all complete. So I'll hop back over to my image browser and here we can see those three new composites for each shot have been saved to the same directory as the original renders. If I open one of these images in mPlay, which is Houdini's own image viewer and sequence player, we can see those additional AOVs which have been generated in the compositing process. Now, of course, we could have done this compositing work in a dedicated compositor such as Nuke or Fusion, but the advantage of doing it all in Houdini and automating the process using PDG means that now if we need to go back in and make a change to the images, then we can just make those changes and then recook the PDG network and all the rendering and compositing work will get done for us automatically for the new versions. So let's go back in and make a change so that we can see this in action. I'll head back over to my Solaris context and I'll switch my viewer to the scene view. And now let's make a global change to all three images. So I'll come back up to my lights and I'll re-enable that light mix node where I've colored the key light purple. And let's make a local edit to one of these shots. So on this first shot, I'll add a prune node and I'll remove this spherical object from the composition. So now we've got a global change to all three images and a local change to just shot one. And before re-rendering this, we can use the dropdown to check how each of the three images are affected by those changes. Now before rendering this job, I need to make sure that I've updated my file name so that I don't oversave the previous set of renders. And in this null here, I've set up this version parameter so in here, I can change the version letter from A to B, and now all the new renders will have version letter B added to the file name. Now to render the new versions of these images, I can just right click on the top network manager and say dirty all, and then select cut output node. And now we see that we have nine individual tasks running. If I dive inside this top network, and I'll just maximize this pane so we can see what's happening. We see that this time PDG recognizes that we've made a change and that it needs to rerun the Karma foreground and background renders before running each of the compositing jobs. Of course, I've sped this up a fair bit and now we see that all those jobs have been processed. If I step back over to my image browser, we can see that for each of these renders, we now have a version A and a version B. We can see that change to the foreground objects in this first shot. And we also see that we have all the composite outputs for the new versions too. 
Now, we could also very easily automate the sets of different images being output to their own folders if we wanted, rather than having them all added to the same directory as I have here. So we can see that Houdini's procedural approach to layout and lighting through Solaris and the way that we can automate things using PDG can save a huge amount of time and effort in managing and outputting multi-shot projects. Now, the last thing I want to talk about before we wrap up is how Houdini makes it very easy to save and reuse your work. Something that I would find as a generalist working across lots of different types of projects is that I might intensively be using a specific tool set or a specific application on a particular project at one point in time and then I might not have to do anything like that again for another 6 or 12 months. By the time I do need to come back and do something similar, I'll often have forgotten as much as I learnt the first time round, and I'd often find myself relearning and redoing things each time. The way that in Houdini everything you do is wired together as a sequence of processes or a series of individual steps means that when you do come back to a project, it's fairly easy to be able to step back through and see exactly what you did last time. This in itself can be a very helpful thing. But what's even more powerful is that Houdini provides a very simple and easy way of saving a whole network or parts of a network so that you can reuse it again at the click of a button. We can very easily turn a collection of nodes into what Houdini calls a shelf tool. So if I wanted to save this automated process that I've set up here to render out a series of images for a multi-shot project, then I can simply select the nodes which I want to be able to reuse. So in this case, I'll select all the nodes after the point where the assets specific to this project are being fed in and now I can simply drag and drop that collection of nodes onto an empty area in the shelf. And in this case, I've created a new shelf, which I've called LOPS Presets. And I'll just name and label this tool Multi-FG Series. As soon as I accept this, we get a button appear for this tool in the shelf. And now I can just click on this, and we see that that whole collection of nodes gets added to the network. The top network to provide the automations here, and if I dive inside, we've got all those same compositing networks. Of course, if we were to do this for real, then we'd want to take some care over the file naming side of things to make sure that we're not pulling in images or assets from a previous project or that we won't be oversaving anything from a previous project when we hit render. Now, the other thing that we could do here is create a whole series of different light presets. So, for example, I can just select this collection of lights and drag and drop these to the shelf. And in this case, I'll name and label this product studio lighting. And now, any time I want to use that same lighting setup again, I can just drag and drop this from the shelf into my network. A shelf tool is essentially the easiest Python script you'll ever write. If we wanted to, we could select this whole network and make it into an HDA, and then do all the work inside here. So HDAs and shelf tools are two different ways that we can use to easily save the work that we've done on one project, and be able to use it over and over again on other projects, or other shots, or other scenes. So to wrap things up, I believe Houdini is a great tool for the generalist because it comes with not only a huge array of off-the-shelf tools to tackle a whole range of different types of work, but it's also a platform or an environment which allows you to build your own custom tools to suit whatever task you're currently working on. By swapping a multitude of different applications, plugins and scripts for Houdini, you get a unified way of working. I personally found that learning and using lots of different applications was time consuming and quite a burden because each different application has its own paradigm and its own unique concepts. And while different areas of Houdini and different tool sets within Houdini do have their own unique features, they generally do work in a similar way. You're always laying down a network of nodes to build a process or a system of some kind, and you're always working with similar concepts such as attributes and parameters. The more you learn about one area of Houdini, the easier it is to learn other areas of Houdini. Of course, with Houdini, you have all the benefits of a procedural workflow. In terms of creative opportunities, it's easy to experiment without feeling that you can never go back. You don't have that fear of making destructive changes because a procedural setup can be edited and adjusted at any time. Proceduralism is efficient because you can make something once and reuse it over and over again. And proceduralism also means that you can work quickly. A procedural setup makes it easy to turn around client feedback in a short space of time, and it's also quick to produce different variations of work when you need to. And finally, with PDG, we have a powerful and intuitive way of automating all those time-consuming and tedious repetitive tasks, which we traditionally carry out manually in other applications. And that's it for me today. Thanks very much for your time, and thanks for listening.